Hello there, this is uh, the Great Johannes speaking for my uh, weekly nowadays podcast, live stream. It's totally unscripted, so I will simply talk about whatever comes up in me. Uh, Let's see if my internet connection is all right. Yeah, I suppose so. Uh, By the way, this is my hat. It's a, what's it called? It's a poet hat by Christie's. I got it, I ordered it from London. And it's basically the Indiana Jones hat, but... uh, in black it's the black version of it so you can see this thick band around it anyway i like it i wear it outside usually not normally inside of course but so i was gonna i was gonna talk about um i was watching a video i don't know what it was called i'd have to look it up but there was a video out today from some kind of show that spoke about the mass gang rapes in uh, in england uh and the message of the of the video was that this is rape on an industrial scale. You know, even in the Netherlands, where I'm from, we heard about the stories of Rotterdam, right? And we heard about these gangs of Pakistani and Bengali men, mostly, and some other men, uh, operating in grooming gangs. So you have grown men in their 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, grown-ass men, uh, organizing themselves in grooming gangs to seduce very young girls, usually teenage girls, 13 years old, 12 years old, even younger, 15 years old, targeting them. And I suppose I can even guess why. Why do they target such young women? You know, if you want to build out your prostitution ring, why don't you work with women over age 20, right? So they're clearly uh, not mentally up to par to deal with grown white women. They can only target children because, well, that's their average intellect, right? We're in the IQ 80 sphere here. And I thought this is just so terrible, especially since, of course, some of these girls, I I know one by name, Victoria Agoglia. So she has an Italian sounding name, but she's a British girl, was because she died. And and she was 15 years old at the time. She was a working class girl with lots of trouble in her life. She got she had a bad start in life, and of course she became the prey for these grooming gangs who sometimes took her out of her home for up to two weeks at a time to abuse her, basically to drug her and abuse her. Uh, there are stories of of such men who keep uh, the unborn fetus. So they, uh, they, they aborted a baby and they kept it in the fridge or in the freezer, right? So no one would know. Uh, they, some of these girls have been murdered. Some of these girls got drug injections that were bad for them and it killed them. And in some cases, um, these guys, these grooming gangs, they would uh, set fire to a girl's house. In one case, a girl and her mom died because they were sleeping in their own house at night. The girl was like 14 years old. She'd been gang raped by these men for for years already. And they decided to have revenge and set fire to her house. Uh, You know, it it can happen when these girls want to uh, be like a witness in a a court case. And then they are targeted with violence, right? To, To get them to shut up. The police doesn't do anything for them or the police has never really done anything for them. The police look away because they're so afraid of stoking racial tensions, right? Um, and then you have these politicians. And if you notice the politicians in England, they are in- increasingly of Bengali and Pakistani and, and Indian and Hindu extraction. And they don't seem to care about the white girls either. Uh, this is becoming a situation of war. I know for a fact that the... Uh, I know for a fact that the U.S. Army at some point officially forbade soldiers to ever uh, sexually target uh, the enemy's women for the specific reason that if you do that, the men of that people will will not cease fighting. They will continue fighting. Basically, it, it motivates men to keep fighting. So it's very strange then that when we hear these stories now, the stories are trickling through because for a long time we never heard about these stories. Right? Someone in my comments... Uh, uh, writes here that they they also read about the story today and they follow the story. Yeah, it's utterly vile, yeah. But this has been going on for decades. I've seen wild estimations that say since 1960 or so, a million or more uh, lower class bright British girls have been raped by these men. Man, that that comes down to like what? That's like one in three or one in four who has been targeted by these mobs. 
you know, or, or something like that. That's how I would I would do the math. I'm just doing the math out the top of my head. But this is so extreme. Why is it that our men don't respond to this as though this were an act of war? We are at war with foreign born men who are sexually targeting, fighting, attacking our own women here, the lower class women. So the media hush it up, the police ignore it. And it's not just England, it's not, it's not just Britain. It's happening in Sweden, it's happening in Germany. I saw a report in Germany that since 2015, over 7,000 German, young German women have been raped by these men who, who came as refugees, who came to Germany as refugees. Um, there's, a, there's a park that I read about. There's a park in Berlin called the Görlitzer Park. And here there's been several cases of gang rape. So a, a native German girl walks through the park, or a woman, in this case it was a 29-year-old woman, they walk through the park at night, say this was uh, during uh, uh, Sylvester, what do you call that, uh, New Year's Eve in Berlin. And three African men, and I mean real Rastafari African, right, rape her in the park for hours on end, right, before they let her go. The police hush this up, right? Uh, the lawyers don't talk about it. The media ignore it. And two weeks before this, this had, ha this had happened before. Another case, another girl had been gang raped there. The police hushed it up. The lawyers don't talk about it. The media ignore it. It's the same program all over again, right? Uh, same in Sweden. I, I've seen reports that, you know, n up to 90%, 90% of the women who get raped in Sweden get raped by a man who wasn't born in Sweden. Again, we have a foreign horde of foreign enemy warriors. These are enemy combatants targeting the weakest victims, young girls, 12 year olds, right? 15 year olds, 18 year olds. They're targeting the women because like I said, those are the only ones they can physically overpower. And those are the only ones they can mentally commandeer, right? Because I think the average grown white woman is actually stronger than the average Pakistani male, right? So, and mentally too, of course. And so they're targeting only the weakest victims, which shows them what kind of men they are, All right? It shows them what kind of men they are, right? This is wrong. You know, we got to do something about this. And it, it, it needs to, meaning when, when I say we got to do something about it, it means it has to stop. It has to come to an end. We have to reduce these numbers. Say it's uh, a thousand rapes a month. We bring them down to 10 a month, right? From a thousand down to 10, whatever it takes. Whatever it takes is what we have to do. And that's the difficulty with this world. There is no political support system for this. The media, like I said, are not on the side of the people. They are on the side of globalist interests and they fear a popular uprising. And there is one thing, one type of story that could potentially truly inflame the men of the, men of the West. The stories of the mass gang rape of the white women in the West. Oh, but the Catholic Church rapes boys. Yeah. Yeah, we'll do something about that too, right? But this is another issue. It's not like, oh, there's other issues, therefore we can ignore this one. No, this is a really big issue. This is the biggest rape story, in fact, right? The, the Pakistani, Bengali, and other type of grooming gang men operating in the West as packs, as hyenas, lusting for blood, lusting for young women's blood, right? This is the biggest rape story in human history, right? Or, or if you have to compare it, you can compare it to what the Russian soldiers did to the East German women after 1945, right? That's the scale of this. It is industrial, industrial scale attack of our women. And maybe, you know, like I said, we got to do something about it that doesn't involve talking, right? It involves acting, it involves action. Yeah, so there's stories like that. Uh, here, another one, Charlene Downs in the UK. Yeah, I heard the story too, and they, they actually discussed uh, cutting her, she, she, they killed her, and then they discussed uh, chopping up her body and uh, putting it in the kebab meat sold to customers to hide as a way of hiding her body. I don't know if they actually did that. I don't think they actually did that, but it shows you what kind of men these are and what they are capable of. Right? They do not consider us equal yet we by law are required to treat them equally because if we don't then we're racist right no they are racist in fact i don't think they're even capable of treating our people equally they don't they don't even treat anybody equally they just they just live for themselves and their families you know there's a big difference in culture between say 
basically European Thai people and everybody else. European Thai people have this Unitarian morality. We actually naturally tend to treat our family members about the same way we treat everybody else, meaning strangers get about the same level of respect that we give our, our brothers and cousins. But not so with everybody else. The people from India, China, uh, Africa, the Arab world, basically all around the world, these people have a dual morality system. They have one set of morals for their immediate family, their cousins and brothers and so on, right? And their moms and their grandparents, and another set of morals for foreigners and strangers, and that's us. They are not even capable of treating us equally, yet if we don't treat them equally, like perfectly equally, they keep calling us racist. You know why they call us racist? Do you know why the people from India and the Arab world and Africans, why they always call us racist? It is a way to dehumanize us, to, to uh, belittle us and dehumanize us and to, to basically say, oh, you are monsters. But of course, that's because they are in, aren't even capable of treating us equally. So what, what other word would you think they would think uh, they would use for us? You know, we have to call them our equals, but they always call us racist, racist monsters, because that is how they see us. Not because it is true, but because they are the racists who are incapable of treating us equally. You know, good evening. Yeah, like I said last time, yeah, the tears of strangers is just water. That's actually a proverb in India. That's how they think about it, you know. Thanks for remembering, you know. I have fans here who remember what I said. <laughs> I better watch my words then. <laughs> well, it's on record anyway. Uh, I will upload my video to my YouTube channel, at The Great Johannes. Um, so you can watch the replay there later, later tonight, uh, in a few hours or so. I will have it up there, yeah. And so, uh, yeah, European culture is based on Judeo-Christian beliefs, yeah. Yeah, although, although the phrase Judeo-Christian wasn't really coined until the 18th or 19th century, though, but yeah, I get your point, I get your point. It's based on this type of morality. But actually, even before, you know, the heathen Europeans, they also treated their family members as somewhat equal to strangers, you know? It's not like we saw strangers as totally abnormal uh, subhumans or something. It, it is really, really odd that in our culture, in the, in the, in the European culture, we actually really came up with the belief in equality, that all people are equal, right? That is why, after all, we allow people to mass migrate into our countries. You know, it's why we say that we have to treat everybody equally, yet we are importing the very people who, who would never return the favor, who would never treat us equally. So, so they say, I have to treat you equally, but you won't treat me equally. Why is that? And so, yeah, well, you're a colonial. Yeah, well, you're a racist. Those words they use, colonial and racist, are simply the words that they learn to use because they know they can get away with it. These are the words they use to dehumanize us, right? To degrade us. And they know they can get away with it. But that doesn't make it real or true. Yeah, good point. It's pathological... Uh Pathological altruism, yeah. Individual acts of resistance will only perpetually break down the system when we're near collapse, you know? Yeah, so, you know, I always uh, refer back to this book that I read called The Forest Passage by a German uh, World War I veteran, Ernst Jünger. He was a philosopher, too. He, he's famous for writing the book uh, Storm of Steel, I recommend that book, by the way. Storm of Steel is such a, well, such a uh, emotionally engaging ver uh, story of the of the first First World War. You know, there's the other book, All's Quiet on the Western Front. You may have heard of it. It's also about the First World War. But these two books are very, very different. All's Quiet, All's Quiet on the Western Front is a book written from a left wing perspective, where war is always bad. And we should never do this again. And we should learn the lessons. Whereas Storm of Steel by Ernst Jünger, that book, Storm of Steel, is about the heroic nature of war. How war is a transformative process for a man. How war, in fact, allows a man to be a hero. You know, Ernst Jünger, in his book, he complains about this fact that um, nowadays war is fought with machines, right? With tanks and bombs and missiles. But in the past, you used to run up to your enemy holding a sword or a saber or, or a bayonet, right? Or something like that, or, or arrows or whatever, or a spear. And you fought people hand to hand almost, right? Or in close quarters, right? Close combat. And that was the true nature of war where men measured each other, right? 
And so he complains about that, that uh, when they start bombing the, the trenches in World War I with these big cannons and big planes, all, it's, it, for World War I was the first machine war. You should look up some pictures because I didn't know about this, but I went to a museum in, uh, in Hungary once where they had, it was a museum, museum about the First World War. And they show you these wall-sized photographs of men operating gigantic machines. Like you have no idea how big these, these cannons were that they were operating in those days. You know, you know nothing, nothing out of this world, but um, it was a machine war. Men were operating machines, but the machines were fighting each other. Right? But when these machines bomb your, your trenches, uh, you know, uh, in the book it's described, it's Storm of Steel, it's described how you know the toughest men start start crying. The toughest men, th the toughest men lose their uh, lose their column because it's just when the when the sirens go off, the alarm goes off. I hate bombing incoming. Everybody's just terrified because there's nothing you can do about it. It is no longer a measure of skill. Like I got a bayonet, you got a sword, and we're measuring how how you know our, our skill level or something. And of course, it's deadly if you get caught. Right, you die. But there's no skill in waiting for the bomb to hit your trenches. There's no skill in that. You, all you can do is wait and hope that you'll survive uh, the next raid or something, right? Oh, someone actually ordered that book, The Forest Passage. Yeah, great, great. I really love that book. Mm. It is, it's basically, well, well you're going to read it, but it's basically a blueprint for a, a rebellion who who will be forced to live a bit off the grid. You go against society. You go against your your corrupt leadership, really. So the forest rebel is like uh, someone who, who doesn't like society, and but he is like the real alpha. It's, it's it's just that he never really shows his face. And this type of alpha person, the forest rebel, he exists only to kill the the elite alphas when the elite alphas go corrupt the forest rebel comes comes for their heads basically that's that's kind of the story of, of what what it is you know yeah guerrilla warfare yeah yeah when will europe rebel how close is the collapse you know america is at, at its tipping point for sure yeah rocket raider says yeah totally agree um, i was i looked at I, I saw this graph a few days ago that showed the cost of uh, the total cost of extracting, transporting, and supplying certain types of energy. So it said gas, oil, uh, solar, and wind, or something like it. a nuclear and so yeah, gas, oil, nuclear, solar, wind. And it turns out that gas was the cheapest by far. Then it was oil, or no, nuclear probably, and then oil. So it was gas, nuclear, oil. And then wind and solar. Wind and solar is, are, is actually incredibly expensive to harvest, so to speak, and then to, dis, to distribute it to people where they need this energy because you need to store it in batteries and so on. It's actually very expensive. Gas is the cheapest source of energy by far in terms of transportation and, and supplying it because it, it flows through pipelines or you have these massive ships, right? Uh, and that's very different though. Oil is probably getting expensive because of the extraction cost. And nuclear is still cheaper than oil if you dare to use it and so there's a lot of people who don't want to use nuclear because they're afraid it might go wrong like uh we saw that at chernobyl right and in japan it went wrong and and there people are very afraid of that which is understandable but it's still cheaper you might you may we may achieve we may get to a point where if we run out of gas we will be forced to switch to nuclear because oil is still more expensive and right? without gas it's going to be nuclear so, you know, you hear stories that France and Poland are building new nuclear, uh, nuclear power plants, but Germany has had theirs completely shut down. I think they had just like five in operation or so, but they shut them all down. The Netherlands too. It's odd. Why are they doing this, you know? Three Mile Island. I haven't heard of that. Is that a book? Is that a book title? Because I'll, I'll check it out. Three Mile Island. I'll make a little note of this. Yeah, someone asked here, like, when does Europe revolt? I suppose, historically, people don't revolt until they actually go hungry. This is what happened in the 1920s in Weimar, Germany. How do you think it, their 1930s really got started? I saw a newspaper article that described that German women who had gone hungry because there was no more food and no more jobs for their men, 
they took their empty bread baskets, bread baskets, and they went looking for the uh, for the finance minister living in Berlin, in that rich people's neighborhood, and they couldn't find the minister at home, and so they got into a fight with the police, and they bashed the police's heads in with their empty bread baskets, and so that is how it starts. It starts when people go hungry. The Arab Spring, for example started because people went, went hungry. It is that moment where people are still well fed and they are about to go hungry, but they still have some energy left. That's when you see these big riots and rebellions. And we need to capitalize on this, like, quote unquote, monetize on it. When this happens in Europe, when Europeans go hungry, you know, there's immediately, immediately, we will see the rise of a new kind of social hierarchy with immigrants at the bottom, obviously. They can't even speak the language, so they're not, not part of this. Then you have, uh, you know, I'd say the lower class and then the middle class and the upper class. And it's, it's going to be hierarchical like that. I don't think people will be prepared for this. When, when, when people go hungry, the rich and powerful, right, they don't starve. The poor starve. So there's a social hierarchy of those who starve and those who don't starve. Same thing with, uh, with dolphins. Sometimes groups of dolphins beach themselves. Turns out the dolphins who do that are the lower ranking dolphins. Basically, they're purging their population to save the others, the higher ranking dolphins here. So this is why we have social hierarchy, by the way. In any group, you have social hierarchy because it determines who gets to die in case of starvation. The lower ranking members of any group are the ones first to starve and first to die in war. When we send men to war, like in the war against Russia with Ukraine, right? Who do you think we send? Upper class men, upper middle class men? No, they don't go. It's the lower class men, the uneducated men, the men with drinking problems, the men with addictions, the men with uh, disabilities. Those are sent first. You always. This is how it always goes. It's not me making this up. It's, it's how human hierarchy works. In any kind of war, the worst men are sent to war. The worst men go first. And usually the wars end before, by the time you run through your worst men. It's, it's not as romantic as Hollywood movies make it seem, right? I've seen so many war movies from the USA, and always you identify with the hero, right? And the heroes are cool guys, right? But in reality, most guys who go to war, there's a reason why they send you to war. You are lower ranking males, and they don't, the society has decided to discard you. That's what it's really about, you know? Do I ever listen to Jonathan Bowden? I've heard of him, but I haven't listened to him quite that much yet. No. Have I been to Germany recently? No, not recently, but a few years ago I was there. I was in, in some city in Western Germany, but these cities look bad, man. Like in terms of the cost of uh, food in Germany, it's considerably lower than it is in the West of the Netherlands. Like if you, if you compare Amsterdam to say, Karlsruhe or, or something like that. In Amsterdam, a beer would cost you six euros. In Karlsruhe, it's two euros, right? And, but you, then you notice the difference. Uh, West German cities are not wealthy anymore. Western Germany is not a rich place anymore, not compared to the Netherlands. You know, it's, it's all very, very different. You know, someone was in a nuclear disaster on the east coast of the USA, really, okay. A nuclear plant in PA almost exploded on Three Mile Island. Okay, yeah. Oh, that's what it was about. But then you get a situation like South Africa. Well, not really. In Europe, we are obviously the white people are still by far the majority. What you know? What you know? What will happen in South Africa? I heard that in South Africa, you have about seven million taxpayers. You have twenty-seven million people dependent on welfare handouts yeah <laughs> and and then you have another 20 million people or so uh who do have do have some kind of income but they don't pay taxes i think they have a population of close to 60 million people get that only one in about one in nine or one in ten people living in south africa actually pays taxes into the state coffers and 27 million people get money from the state coffers Guess who's starving first? It's the people living off the welfare. They will starve first. The other people apparently have economic skills, so they are more important, see? People with economic skills will not be discarded as easily as the people merely taking handouts, you know? Yeah, I'll check out Jonathan Biden, uh, Bowden, yeah? Check him out, yeah? 
it would be great if the Western Cape can get an independence. Yeah, where did that come from? All of a sudden, I see this idea on X on Twitter, like the West Cape independence, West Cape independence. It makes sense if you mean it's going to be for like for mostly for white people, right? It, it's better than this this idea of Orania because that's a very small place. Orania can be surrounded easily by an army, and then well, what are you going to do? Where are you going to run to? Right? Whereas, of course, if you have a whole west, a whole part of this place. Uh, for yourself to you know disconnect from it but I wonder where the idea came from because I never heard it before until like a week ago and it's not like I never never stay up to date in the news you know but I suppose I suppose it has something to do with the fact that um, you know there's the Houthi rebels you know what okay the Houthi rebels in Yemen are attacking ships including even ships that are supposed to supply Europe with LNG gas and so they've kind of cut off Israel, right? Because you need to go past these Houthis to get to the Suez Canal to, sh to bring your stuff and your, your goods and your energy to the European markets and also to Israel. So Israel is a, bit, a little bit cut off now. And I suppose if it stays that way, then a lot of sea traffic, oceanic traffic, will have to make a stop in South Africa. Right? They will have to go back around the tip of Africa before they can get to Europe again. So this is very costly. It's much more expensive than simply going through the Suez Canal. But you see what they're doing now? Maybe that's where the idea of the West Cape independence came from all of a sudden. Namely, uh, if you, you, need, you need a part of South Africa under control of the British American Empire. So you know, be wary of who comes up with these ideas. Uh, I suppose they will allow Afrikaners to live in, in the West Cape in that situation and to work. But it's probably more, it's probably like a British American Israeli idea because they will need to secure harbors there, right? For the shipping in case, in case the Houthi rebels uh, mess it all up. So, uh, oh yeah, is there a, uh, Oh, someone, ex oh yeah, the other Johannes, he, ex he exposed uh, Orania and the regular, yeah. I, I don't know all about it, but yeah. Maybe it's, uh, yeah, someone asked if they can listen back to this later. Yeah, yeah, I will, when I'm done with this, I will upload it to my YouTube channel at The Great Johannes. And there you can uh, see, you can watch the replay in a few hours there, yeah. Then you can see the full episode. So maybe uh, I'll talk a little bit more about plans for Europe. No one in Europe seems to have any clue of what we are supposed to do. Maybe that's because they, the real leaders, the globalists, they see Europe merely as uh, change, right? Uh, as a place they can sacrifice in order to save their other interests. For example, the globalists would consider Israel more important than Europe. They will, they will sacrifice 700 million Europeans to save 7 million people living in Israel. I think they would do it. They would be capable of doing that. And so I heard uh, Ursula von der Leyen, this, whoever, most people don't even, don't even know who she is. She's some kind of EU leader, EU bureaucrat. I don't even know her official title, but she seems to think that she's in charge of the EU, even though she's just an employee working for American interests, probably. And she had her mouth full with a lot of words that end in the, in the letter Sion, T-I-O-N, like globalization and uh you know things like that organization she has she, they speak of these highly abstract concepts so that they won't have to talk about what they don't want to talk about which is they the whole eu only serves the billionaire interests of a, of a class of people living in israel and the usa they don't serve us so she she proposes all these abstract sounding phrases without saying even one concrete thing and we in Europe, I think, need to face the reality. I started this live show talking about the rape gangs. That's our first problem. We need to deal with the rape gangs. You know, we need to deal with the discrimination against our own people. We need to perhaps come to terms with the fact that diversity is not a strength. Yeah, I figured that out <laughs> a while back, but uh, how many people still think that immigration is not a big deal? Turns out people in Europe underestimate immigration into Europe by a factor 10. It's 10 times worse than what most people think. No wonder they keep voting for open borders, right? I mean, we need to put an end, you know, in Europe we have, 
you know, we have several problems in Europe, concrete problems that we simply need to tackle and face. The EU is a sort of Soviet style communist system that really only serves to exploit us and harm us and sabotage us and keep us weak and, and depressed and, in, and impoverished, right? They don't want a strong Europe. A strong Europe is a threat to the USA, of course. You know, we have a leadership crisis in the West. We have politicians who, who are so totally deluded. I don't think they even understand or have any grasp of reality at all. They're just actors. But even their screen, even their script writers, even their ghost authors, even they don't know what's going on. Like no one really cares to know what's going on. It's all highly ideologized, right? It's it's a phantasmagoria. People are just living in this uh, fantasy la la land. Oh well, this is what we want to do, and we'll just do it. And they have no no understanding that ordinary people quit listening to them a long time ago. You know. Yeah, diversity was never a strength. No. Ursula von der Leyen. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I saw in Ireland, you know, this is so bad. Did you see that in Rosecrea? I don't know if I remember the name of the town correctly, but you had these Gardai people. Gardai, that's uh, the Irish police force. And and they escorted like hundreds of newcomers uh, from Africa, apparently, uh, into, these, into these housing facilities, into hotels and so on. Luxury hotels, you know. And there were there were some uh, local native Irish people who came to protest this, and the police just forcefully pulled these people apart. And and basically, the police need. And by the way, these police officers they were all white. Yeah, all white police officer men are betraying their own people by moving in foreign invaders and squatter colonists. I love this phrase squatter colonists by the way because you have the settler colonists right that's us and then you have the squatter colonists who live in other people's buildings right that's the difference between settling and squatting right when when the white man went to australia we did not move in with the aboriginals we did not move in with the tp people in uh, in north america right we didn't want to become like them right we had our own thing to do we built our own nations and then everybody wants to come live with us and be like us because they watch Superman on TV and they they identify with Superman and now they think they they can get a Western haircut right and buy a, buy a Western clothing and now they're they're a white people too right you know I I, I gave it a name I call it like uh, it's not transracialism but it's more like uh, a psychoracial confusion disorder. <laughs> I made it all up, but if you use big words like that, people start to believe it's a real condition, like psycho-racial confusion disorder. It's when you're a, a guy from Iran, right? But you you bleach your skin to look whiter, and then you think you're Superman, or you think you're Clark Kent or something, right? It <laughs> people get mad when you point it out that, of course, a man from Ghana moving to London can fool himself into thinking he's now a real British person because he wears a British hat. Yeah, that doesn't make you British. <laughs> you can't you can't ever be British. There are no universal human archetypes. All archetypes, all our heroes are peculiar, particular to a certain ethnic group of people. Say in in, uh, in Europe we have Germanic fairy tales, right? Of uh, Rapunzel and uh, Snow White and uh, the brother Grimm's. They collected this. Uh, they collected these books, right? And you have. Uh, who else you have the little mermaid that's a danish story uh but we have a uh, anyway we have a lot of these fairy tales coming out of the germanic world that were popularized in the us by disney and so the whole world what the whole world calls fairy tales are actually german germanic fairy tales right so it's very very particular to to well my kind of people and Yet the whole world now thinks that they own these fairy tales as though these are universal human fairy tales, but they're not. They're not universal. They're particularly Germanic fairy tales. And they they express a certain Germanic soul, right? Do you get my point? It's not the Hutu soul. It's not the Bantu soul. It's not the Arab soul. It's not the Hindu soul. It's the particularly Germanic European soul that is expressed in these fairy tales. These stories really only make sense if you are a Germanic person, right? 
and now okay disney can blow this up and make movies about ariel the little mermaid or something or they can make movies about whatever you know even the story of uh, indiana jones was actually based on a book that was based on the life of percy fawcett a british explorer uh, and so you see that a lot of these stories and movies you know they they come from us they are distinctly european and of course, you, if you're a brown person or a black person, you can watch our movies and then you can identify yourself in the first person with Indiana Jones or something like that or Batman or Spider-Man or whatever. Right? You get my point, right? But even a black Superman is still a white archetype. It is white culture, a white cultural archetype. But now you gave gave the role to a black person. This is what they did to uh, Norse mythology, of course, and through the Marvel Comics franchise because they copied Norse mythology, right? Thor and Odin, whatever. And then they they have like Idris Elba play Heimdall, who is described as the whitest of all gods, you know. <laughs> but of course, in the book, what they mean by whitest, they mean bright, shiny, bright, possibly the most intelligent. That's what they meant. And they give the role to, you know, well, you get my point, you know. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Surprising that James Bond is still uh, <laughs> surprising that James Bond is still still white. But I think they aren't they going to change that as well. There's going to be a black James Bond, right? But it will be so silly, man. Nobody will believe that. You know, what's he going to come on? What's he going to do? Like, listen to gangster rap, you know? Come on. It is Alba, yeah. They're changing everything except so far James Bond, you know. But, you know, you can have a, a black Indiana Jones, but then why don't they make the, the movie about Jacques Azulu? Jacques Azulu is a really a Negro archetype. Jacques Azulu wins power and his mom is still alive, right? And you have to imagine how, they, how these men really are like. They actually grow up under the domineering force of their mothers, right? Their mothers are these big black mamas. They're very domineering. And all these Negro men, they are raised by their moms only. You know, they have, uh, you know, they don't have the fathers, right? The fathers are in jail. So they grow up with their moms. The moms are overly commandeering and domineering. And these Negro men, they grow up naturally accepting that the women rule their societies. This is how it was in Africa before we found her, right? So Jacques Azulu is basically a pawn of his mother. At some point, though, and he, he's okay. At, at this point, Jacques is doing all right. He's good for his people, right? But then his mother dies, and the guy com goes completely nuts. He orders pregnant women to be killed. If he, if he sees pregnant women walking down the streets, he orders them killed. He has these extremely bizarre, paranoid laws that he puts in place. And very quickly, his people turn against him and they kill him, right? So it's, it's in, that, will be, that will be a really great movie because it shows you exactly how they really are. How are black men? Black men are really men who expect women to be their leaders. Really, they, they naturally expect women to be the leaders. And, and they just do whatever their, mommies, whatever their moms tell them to do. They're, they're totally under the spell of this mega feminism. You know, this is why... I think the Western feminists love black people so much, right? Because black people are naturally feministic, whereas the white men of Europe would not accept us. We would not, I would not personally, ex I don't see Merkel or Ursula von der Leyen as my leader. I see them as women who should not be, even shouldn't be thinking that they're in charge of anything. Okay, admittedly though, yeah, sure, the men aren't in charge anymore, yeah. We've been demoted, yeah. But that doesn't mean I'm following the women's lead in these matters. I think what Ursula von der Leyen is doing, promoting open borderism, promoting feminism and veganism, and, and you know, the whole smorgasbord of, of bad policy, I clearly go against it. I'm not, I have no intention of laying down and, and submitting myself to this, you know. I will never accept this. It's just so weird. They was Kangs, yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah, the British Empire wants to universalize everything. Yeah, that's a good point. Because if you have a universal global world, they can be what? They, they can be like the shadowy lead behind the world and make all the money, right? They, all they care about is money. Uh, someone I mentioned before on the, the Daniel Natal show, I'll, I'll type his name in so you can Google him because he's on, uh, he's on uh, YouTube. The Daniel Natal show, he explained it as follows. After the Second World War, our elites 
built the NATO army. They built the United Nations. They built the World Bank and the IMF and so on and so forth, right? And these things are all the components that you will need for a global government. They really are working toward the establishment of a global government. But so far, there are people or parties that don't want to join them. Russia and China, for example, don't want to submit to the Western version of the rules-based order. So the Western world believes that corporations should ru rule the world. But China and Russia believe that governments should rule the world or states. So that's the difference here. That's the distinction. I personally see a third way. I personally believe that neither governments nor corporations should rule the world, but that perhaps, you know, we can, uh, you know, there's, I, I suppose there is a third option, which is what we should do in Europe. Europe can become something like a genuine republic, a republic which serves uh, the best interests of its own people, our survival. And that means, therefore, our mental strength, our physical strength, our economic strength, right? And to support I mean, the opposite of the whole woke stuff. Instead of LGBT, we will, we will not have that. We will have, you know, families, right? Instead of, um, you know, instead of diversity, we won't have that anymore. We will have unity or alliances with people we can trust, right? So that's what I mean. We'll do, we'll do the opposite of the woke stuff, the unwoke empire, the unwoke Europe. Here, someone, someone says they're from South Africa, but they don't want to leave South Africa. Can you please give some advice? You know, you have six or so, six million white people living there. And, you know, the thing with South Africa is uh, you are surrounded by a majority of black people who hate you, who want you dead. So, you know, in case, sh in case it really goes wrong, I, th I feel you should have the right to flee to Europe. You would be genuine refugees after all. But, you know, Europe itself is not a solution. We're not paradise. We have tremendous problems ourselves here. So it's not like it's better here. That's not true. Uh, the way I, what I would want to do with Europe is if we make Europe strong, we can then make the colonies strong. We can have a strong South Africa and a strong Canada, a strong U.S. middle class, basically. But uh, no longer these corporate parasites who, who just leech off of us thinking that they can just do that. They can't do that anymore. <clears throat> oh, I see some people sent me some, uh, some gifts. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> All right. Let's see. Yeah, so another book recommendation. Okay. Yeah, just by knowing the history of the governing, the corporations and the guilds, everything becomes clear. Yeah. You know, I wonder what, what these so-called elites are going to do. Man. They really see people as animals or less than that, less than cattle as ants in, a, in an ant farm. They don't care about us. They don't respect us. So we in Europe need to understand that the U.S. and the Israel, they would sacrifice us to save themselves. Uh, the Africans hate us and they, they want to like, you know, they always speak of karma and the chickens coming home to roost, which is silly because they, ca they can't. The Africans can't invade Europe. If they tried, there would be too many of them here. People would starve. And then the winter comes. Say we have one harsh winter. Say, say 500 million or nay, no, 200 million black Africans come to Europe, right? And they think they're conquering. They think they're taking over, right? And then a winter comes, a harsh winter. What happens? We have no fuel to heat our homes. They die. They die. You know, they can't, you can't take Europe like that. It doesn't work. We, ha we actually have too many people in Europe, and we need to actually make sure that we could somehow send 200 million out, like send all the, uh, you know, all the immigrants out, and, and perhaps some more people will be forced to leave anyway, because you can't survive in Europe. Not, not if we have fuel, uh, fuel shortages. You know, China wants its own rule-based order and it wants to submit the world to it. Russia still dreams of rebuilding the Russian Empire. They, they think they can rule Eurasia. This is that Duganism, that the Eurasianism. Uh, I don't believe in that. I think Europe actually has the best chances of becoming the new world power, not China. The USA will wane economically. Uh, China can't do it because they don't have an appeal. 
I was just talking about how Western culture, our fairy tales and so on through Disney and the Hollywood where it's promoted around the world. We have the appeal. Like, can you even can you even mention one Chinese fairy tale or one African hero? Well, I mentioned Shaka Zulu, but that's a historical figure. Like like one literary hero from Africa. I can't even name one. You know? It's not because their culture just doesn't appeal. It's not popular. They their their stories are not so appealing to to the rest of humanity. Whereas the Western Western stories are all about overcoming, about improving yourself, about bettering yourself, right? And that appeals to people, right? Here we have two or three million immigrants in Sweden of all of about thirteen million inhabitants. Yeah, that's extreme, yeah. Yeah, Tarzan. Tarzan is a is a white guy, right? <laughs> Uh, uh, I feel that the TikTok censorship has changed. Last summer, it was so extreme. I lost several accounts very quickly after one another. Uh, almost every video I made was reported. or uh, And then I did win a lot of the appeals, but because so many of my videos were reported, I kept losing my accounts. Nowadays, what I've noticed, the past 10 videos of mine that were reported... I won the appeal 10 out of 10 times. And and what I do then is I hide those videos. I set them to private. Otherwise, they may be reported again and you'll lose them again. Then you won't be able to appeal. And so, so far, I've been on this winning streak in terms of winning the appeals. So TikTok is becoming a bit more lenient. And maybe I'm also getting a little bit better at my choice of words and phrasing. But still, I think that's wrong. I, I wish I want to be way more direct than I can be. Uh, for example, I'm going to upload this video to YouTube. So there's like certain words you cannot say. I also noticed that on TikTok, there are certain keywords that once, because they have a speech recognition system going on behind every video, right? That's how they produce those uh, subtitles. So TikTok looks for certain words that you say. And, and so there's uh, a, a two-tier two censorship system. They have their AI listening to your words and then they censor you based on the words that you spoke. And then there's the user reported censorship that also exists so that if a bunch of users would gang up on a certain video of mine and they report it, then that video also gets taken down. So it's a dual dual system that they use now. Yeah, I figured this out uh, through experience, right? Because <laughs> so many of my accounts were taken down. But at least TikTok lets you win the appeals. YouTube doesn't do that. With YouTube, you get like three strikes and you're out, but there's no appeals. Or you can apply for appeal, and then a minute later they say, sorry, you lost your appeal. Yeah, then why did you let me appeal it, you know? Yeah, that's the difficulty. The censorship is really extreme. It's partly also because of women, right? There are now these... I saw there's this group of seven women. They all look white, but I assume most of them are Jewish. Right, maybe one token non-Jewish white woman is in the team, but there's like seven of them working for the EU, and they're going to design the speech codes for the social media companies in the European Union or something like it. And and you know how women are. For women, it's all about the words, right? It's not whether or not what you said was true, but how it sounded. And they're going to impose such strict, such extreme speech um, restrictions. But how is that really going to be effective if? Even I, with my extreme ideas, I can easily swap out one word, like the word moron. I can swap it out for, you know, you know, misfit. So instead of moron, I'll just say misfit, right? So problem solved. And then, it, and then I get away with it again. So that doesn't work. All you're doing is you're forcing me to be more creative with words. And I have no trouble doing that, you know. And that's that's why those those speech programs just won't work. All you are really going to do is you're going to harm, say, lower class people who are uh, overly direct or not smart enough to come up with creative new creative new words and new phrases. Those are the only people who will be hit by it. But then what are you going to do? You're going to send them to jail. You're going to send people to jail for years for calling somebody a moron, for example, or a misfit. You're going to send them to jail for that. You know, again, it seems like they're, they're all all these things. They're attacking the, the lower class first, see? And that's wrong. So where is all that, all that, 
all those stories about elevating the lower classes, right? They're elevating the working classes. They're not doing this at all. They're destroying the working classes and they don't even care. That's just so wrong. I think there is a good way to rise to power in Europe. You promise the native Europeans housing for their children, better jobs, better income, you know, who wouldn't vote for that? You know, then we can vote, vote ourselves back into power and we vote, you know, and then we vote the immigrants out. You know, it shouldn't be too hard. It should, it should be perfectly doable, you know. You know, these elites, there's a woman, the sister of Jelen Maxwell. You know, Jelen Maxwell was uh, involved with Epstein and, and she actually herself also raped girls. Bizarre, right? And then her sister is in Davos and she's some kind of important high up person at the, at the World Economic Forum. I think she's the technology minister of the World Economic Forum or something like it. The sister of Jelen Maxwell. <laughs> Do you believe that? Come on, this is just so weird. <clears throat> of course, you know, the sister, if the sister is innocent, she's innocent. But it's weird that this kind of family is high up in all these places. And they these are the sort of people you're dealing with, right? They don't care about Europe, man. I was watching a little bit of the Davos conference. And you see these women talking. And I can see, right? You can tell, oh, she's Jewish. Oh, Jewish. Oh, Jewish. Especially with the women, the, the female... Jews, the Jewesses, it's so easy to spot them. It's their hair and their curls and also their facial features. And of course, it's not always the nose, by the way. It's actually the general facial feature. Once once you pay attention to it, you start to recognize them. Oh, Jewish, Jewish, Jewish. You start to be able to recognize them like really, really quickly. And it's not the nose. It's the general facial feature that tells you that's the dead giveaway, you know? <clears throat> How do you get out of poverty? Rob a bank, you know, strike oil. But working for money is not a way to get rich. If you want to get rich, you have to be, you know, unscrupulous. <clears throat> I, I do have a Rumble account. Uh, my YouTube videos are automatically posted onto Rumble, but there's a massive delay. It can sometimes take weeks. Uh, I don't want to manually upload my videos to all these platforms. It's too much work. I also have a mirror on BitChute. BitChute, you can also find my videos there. <clears throat> Ransomware campaigns against mega corporations. Let, let me know if that works. <laughs> it would be, I would like to know more about it if it works. You know. <clears throat> but something like that, yeah. <laughs> You know, if, if if these companies rely on technology so much, and that is, of course, a weakness at some point, especially with their... Imagine this. Imagine under a program of diversity hires, like Boeing did, right? They hire a bunch of diverse people, and all of a sudden, their security systems no longer are secure, right? <clears throat> and hackers start to get in. Because they're, they're firing the smartest white guys because they're white. They're hiring dumbasses because they happen to be non-white. And at, at what point do the fired white guys have revenge by launching ransomware attacks on mega corporations? <laughs> exactly. Who, who's going to stop them? Who's going to stop them? You're firing the most competent men, replacing them with average men, right? At some point, the jobless competent men are going to take over, but on their own terms, right? That's how it is. I'm also on Twitter at JohannesMKX. Uh, take risks. If it works, we all eat. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. Who's John Galt? John Galt is a character from that book by Ayn Rand, The Fountainhead or something like that. It's like an entrepreneur. I never read these books, but I happen to know this. Uh, sticks and arrow. I think the American social media are dying. Like Twitter, Twitter is going to be fine, I think. But uh, Instagram, 
Facebook, who uses Facebook anymore? I haven't used Facebook in years now. Uh, Instagram seems to be dying. Nobody uses Instagram anymore because TikTok was more fun, right? TikTok is doing okay, but you know none of these platforms will last for long. It's always a hype cycle of a few years and then it drops off, right? Then it becomes commercial and they start milking the cow. <coughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Yeah, restore European leadership, right? We need a warrior class. We need a fighting nobility. Men who are willing to brave it all to win power. That's what we need. And we need alliances of such men to overthrow, you know, Islam, immigration, <clears throat> diversity, the bankers, yeah, the corporations to some extent. It's not like, look, I have nothing against corporations that produce something of use, but I have something against the corporations who only make up stories like disaster bonds, like who make up financial products that don't, that don't exist in reality, but they somehow trick people to buy them so they can make money. And that's, <clears throat> that's really bad. You know? Really, Snapchat is a feral app, yeah, full of predators. Yeah, yeah, I don't use Snapchat, but all right, that's it for today. I'll be back next week, probably Tuesday again, and then you can uh, you can rewatch this whole video on YouTube later. Uh, at the Great Johannes is my YouTube uh, username, so I'll type it in for a bit if you really need to know. And then, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know about Trump. Whether Trump will be president, I don't know if they want to allow him, you know. The deep state is going to, I think you can see it's even more likely that you'll have a military coup behind the scenes and they'll just take over. The, the, the Pentagon will take over because they're not, they're not going to let Trump make peace with Russia. That's for sure. What they're going to do is they're going to go to war anyway, and either Trump supports that or they take him out, you know. That's it, so... Well, see you next time, you know.